We've all heard that saying, you are what you eat. I want you to think of your deaf dog barking in the same way. If I have unlimited access to chocolate, cakes and cookies, then eating a salad every so often is not going to help me lose weight. I need to set up my environment so I can practice making better choices each day. Barking is the same. If we allow our deaf dogs unlimited access to situations where they're probably gonna bark, you're not going to achieve your training goals. Just like me and chocolate, preventing access and rehearsing good choices are key to long-term success. Hey, it's Natalie from Canine Concepts, the home of game-based training for deaf dogs. Now, I wanna make it clear, this video is not about what to do when your deaf dog barks. Forget about reacting after the fact. If they're already barking, that ship has sailed. And if you're on this channel, then you're looking for a solution that doesn't involve intimidation or using aversive tools. I can assure you, you don't need to train like that in order to help your dog with their barking. Instead, we take a proactive approach and stop the barking before it even happens. I'm gonna show you how we use access, games, and a trait of responsibility to stop your deaf dog from barking in the first place. So where do we start? Lots of reward-based trainers will tell you that you first must find out why they're barking. And that's great, but how am I supposed to know? The situations that your dog barks in will give you clues. The majority of barking fits into four broad categories. The first is a discrete stimulus. This is a fancy way of saying your dog is barking at a thing. They're barking at a dog, the postman, a ceiling fan. If you don't know what the thing is, then don't worry. Just take note of factors like the time of day, the location, and any other behaviors they do, like running into the garden while they're barking. We've then got the barrier frustration and separation related behaviors. The emotions driving these situations can differ, but the pictures look similar. Essentially, there is some form of barrier preventing your dog from accessing something they value. So your dog's ball is under the couch and barking because they can't get to it. Or your dog is on lead, they desperately want to say hi to another dog and they're barking because they can't get to them. Or you're the thing of value that they can't get to because God forbid you enter the bathroom and you close the door or you left the house entirely. The next category sadly happens more often than you think, pain or discomfort. One situation that's commonly overlooked is a dog barking because they have digestive discomfort. If you think your dog is barking at nothing, but it tends to happen after they eat or before they go to the toilet, see a vet. The same goes for if they have bad gas or inconsistent stools. This is not normal. Talk to your vet. The final broad category I'm going to talk about is sometimes referred to as demand barking or action prompting. Essentially, the dog is barking at you to make something happen. They bark for their dinner, you feed them. They bark for you to throw the ball, you throw it. They bark at another dog to play with them, and that dog plays with them. Now, just as an aside, if you have a puppy or an adolescent dog and they're barking, see if they need a nap. Puppies need 18 to 20 hours sleep every day, and even adult dogs need between 16 to 18 hours rest, most of which should be sleep. So if your pup is barking and not at least close to those targets, work on sleep first. So now we've got a fair idea of why our dog might be barking, now we're gonna do something about it. And we're going to do this in three phases. In phase one, we focus on access. Look, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. You gotta stop putting your dog in situations where they're gonna rehearse barking. In the same way that we are what we eat, your dog becomes what they rehearse. If they have access to situations where they can rehearse barking today, they become better at barking tomorrow. And the more they practice the barking, the harder it is to change down the track. So in phase one, we're going to prevent unsupervised access to locations where the barking happens. I'm taking back the proverbial car keys. If my dog is not making good choices, they're telling me they're not ready for that level of responsibility yet. I'm not gonna sign no or use aversive tools. It's not their fault they're barking. It's my fault because I've not taught them how to behave appropriately in that situation. I'm not gonna go and blame the dog for my rubbish training. The exact strategy in phase one is going to look a little bit different depending on why they're barking, but there's some general rules of thumb you can follow. If they're barking at a discrete stimulus in the house, I'm not going to give them access to to those perches where they can sit and wait for something to bark at. So if they sit at the front window barking at delivery drivers, visitors or passers-by, in phase one, they don't get access to that space. Instead, we spend our time in a different part of the house where they can chill out and not be on high alert all day. Discrete stimuli like reflections or shadows can require a bit more creativity, so we'll work through one of these cases in a moment. 
Now, if your dog is primarily barking when they're out and about, just like before, we're not going to keep putting them in a situation that they're obviously not ready for. But we need to approach that situation a little bit differently than what we did for barking in the house. I've actually got a whole course that'll take you step by step through how to help your dog if they're barking and lunging on walks. It's called Canine Connect, I'll link to it below. Now, if your deaf dog is barking in a crate or while they're behind a closed door or a baby gate, you're gonna take it back a few steps. Your dog is telling you they're not ready for that level of challenge yet. If you need a training plan, I've got a video on that. If they're barking when they're left alone, it may not be frustration driving the behavior. It could actually be fear. Separation related behaviors really do benefit from working one-on-one -on -one with a qualified trainer who doesn't use aversive tools or intimidation. You're welcome to get in contact with me if you want some guidance. If your deaf dog is barking at you to prompt you to do something, that needs a slightly different strategy again. Let me know in the comments if that would be helpful and I can make a video about it. So that's phase one done. Access to barking opportunities prevented. For some people, once their barking is under control, they're happy to just stick with the prevention strategies in phase one. That's totally okay. But a lot of folks want to move beyond that. Phase two is all about games. And the key game we want to work on in phase two is the it's all good game. This game teaches your deaf dog that whatever they're barking at is none of their business and nothing to worry about. It's all good. We're going to start this game by practicing Focusing on things your dog doesn't bark at. That way, neither of us can get it wrong. And just like me choosing salads, your dog is going to get practice at making good choices. So they notice a leaf blowing past. You're going to give them their marker hand signal. Yep, it's all good. And then calmly deliver a piece of food between your dog's paws. Then we just wait for the next event to naturally happen. Maybe you stand up. Your dog notices that but they mind their own business and choose to stay put. So you mark that choice, it's all good. Then go over and place a treat between their paws. And when I say treat, it can just be some of their dinner that they would have had out of a bowl. Something that's really important in phase two is to ensure you're still preventing access to those barking perches like you did in phase one. We add phase two, we don't get rid of phase one yet. As your dog starts getting the hang of this game, you can gradually start marking moderately challenging events events like the cat going past them or your toddler dropping food on the floor. Just like before, we mark and reward our dogs for going meh, it's all good and minding their own business. When your dog is showing progress with these everyday events, hey, they didn't follow me into the kitchen. That's your cue that they're ready to start phase three. In phase three, we slowly give them responsibility back. For the dog barking in the garden, open the door for short periods of time while you're supervising them. And if you see them perk up like they're about to bark, but they haven't barked just yet, give them their marker and feed them a treat before they bark. Now, it's totally normal for phase three to have a bit of back and forth. You give them a bit more access and responsibility and they do well. Brilliant! You then give them a bit more access and oops, they have a little blip. Don't panic. We just take back some of that responsibility by putting some of those prevention strategies back in place. Did they bolt out the back door to bark at something in the garden? Okay, close the door. If you want to test a layer of access like an open door, but you want a little bit of extra security, then clip on a lighthouse line. That way, if they do get up and you think that they might bark, you can gently get their attention to interrupt the behavior before it turns into a full-blown bark fest. Then kindly direct them to a more appropriate activity like chilling out on their bed and reward that behavior. No big deal. This back and forth is totally normal, but to maximize their success, it's important to give them access slowly and at the same time to up your efforts with the it's all good game. Reason being, as we give them more access, our dogs are going to be gradually exposed to their triggers again. We've got to ensure that all that practice they did minding their own business is actually carrying over into those tricky trigger situations. If we just go, right, free access and we don't support them with our games, we'll just keep going back and forth without making much progress. If you're getting some value from this video, consider giving it a thumbs up so it can spread to more deaf dog families. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, what does this phase three strategy look like in real life? Let's say your deaf dog is barking at reflections. In phase one, we prevent access to the situations where they usually bark. 
we temporarily take down any wall mirrors or clocks they're finding tricky. Maybe we put a removable film over any windows or glass surfaces that are causing an issue. Of an evening, we might draw the curtains and have our dog settled on their bed or in a crate so they don't rehearse the barking. Now, if your dog is chasing or pouncing on shadows or lights, then please take note. Abnormal repetitive behaviors can become a real problem. It's important you work with a qualified professional who doesn't use aversive tools or intimidation. Feel free to flick me a message so we can have a chat. When we move into phase two, remember we keep up the access stuff from phase one and add the it's all good game. With our reflection barking dog, we prevent them seeing the reflections. And then we're marking and rewarding those everyday events like people moving about the house or leaves blowing past. We'll also start marking parallel situations. We're not moving into their triggers yet, but we want to look at similar events. So if your dog is barking at reflections, then maybe they just notice a shadow being cast in the evening. When your dog notices this event, but they aren't reacting, we mark, it's all good, and then calmly feed a treat between their paws. Parallel situations are your dress rehearsal for real life. Of course, if your deaf dog is barking at the shadow, then that's not a parallel situation. That's a trigger. Revisit phase one, prevent access to prevent rehearsal. When your deaf dog is doing well with more and more parallel situations, we can then gradually move into phase three. We're going to give them back some responsibility. To do this, we slowly give them access again, one piece at a time. We want to think back to the reflections that were least troublesome. Maybe they only barked at the wall clock occasionally. That's where we start. When our dog is calm, we put the clock back on the wall, but just for short periods of time to start with. Don't make a big deal of it, and there's certainly no need to point it out to your dog. Just ensure they're supervised while the wall clock clocks back up. Why? Because if they do happen to notice the clock, you're going to play the it's all good game. Mark and reward them for noticing the clock, but staying relaxed. If they don't care about the clock, perfect. That's exactly what we want. Mark and reward that choice. Progress to the next easiest trigger if your dog is proving to you that they're 100% ready to take on that level of responsibility. This whole process teaches your dog, hey, I saw that thing too, even if I didn't. Well done for not barking, even though you're about to. Here's a calm, positive outcome to encourage you to make those good choices again in the future. What we're aiming for at the start is a pause, a moment of hesitation where you can get in and reward them for just taking a breath. You see, in order for our dogs to notice triggers and not respond at all, we need to start small. Let's start with a pause, a breath, a single moment. Over time, we can grow that and test to see if they're ready for more responsibility. Are you capable of more than a breath? Can they notice a trigger and then settle back down again? How great would that be? This phase three training plan builds that skill. Remember at the beginning of the video, I said we weren't gonna focus on this, but I know you're all wondering, what do I do if they bark? Well, because we've done such a good job with preventing access to purchase in phase one, this should be a rarity. But if they do bark, you're gonna do two things. One, you're going to kindly get their attention. Something like a tactile orientation cue is really helpful here. Happily call them away and get them calmly settled on their bed or in a crate. Then reward that calm behavior. Two, you're gonna make a mental note about what went wrong. Your access plan just failed. Why? What happened and what could you have done differently to set them up for success? Did they just need to be stationed a bit further away from the trigger to remain relaxed? Cool, move their bed further away. Making a mental note about what went wrong is critical because it stops behavior chains happening. We don't want our deaf dogs to practice barking at the thing and then coming to get a treat. Don't get me wrong, it's not the end of the world and that is so much better than barking incessantly, but if we follow the three phases carefully, we can do better than that. Okay, so the thing is, even with this amazing three-phase training plan, if your dog isn't choosing to voluntarily go to and stay on their bed or in their crate throughout the day, not because someone commanded them to go there, but because they love staying in those places more than anywhere else then that's something you're gonna wanna grow to get those real bomb-proof barking results you're after. I explain the key to getting a strong default stay in this video, so make sure you watch that next. Combine that knowledge with your three-phase plan and it'll really help you move towards your goals. Go check it out.